to hi comrades and friends uh, just to clarify a couple of points um, I wish it had been in the IDF one year it was over three years so it was a very long three years and um, I am president of chapter 21 of Veterans for Peace part of the globalization of the veterans movement uh, that is slowly expanding and incorporating veterans um, throughout the world who have changed sides and now uh, want to fight imperialism. Um, aren't we all inspired by what's going on now in Palestine? I mean, you know, we, we see the videos and, 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 and hear the reports, but there can be a lot of confusion. Uh, Recently, um, the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, uh, accused a, some minor religious figure from the 1940s of instigating um, the extermination of like six million Jewish people in Europe. You know, so uh, we have to be very careful about what we hear. And just an example, um, today uh, in the West Bank, a rabbi was stone kicked, punched, and almost stabbed. And kind of in the context of what's happening, and knowing, you know, some of the rabbis in the West Bank, we could we could say, hey, that was a good thing. You know, the settlers were confronted. But it turned out that rabbi was uh, president of an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights, and he, with other Israelis and international solidarity activists were accompanying Palestinian farmers uh, to give them some space and protection uh, and when they were harvesting um, olive trees on their land because they continually get attacked by settlers. And there it is, you may see the video of him being attacked by one of these um, right-wing settlers with a hood and kind of these are some of the things, you know, that go on. Um, and just on the other, kind of the other side, um, recently a um, member of the Israeli Knesset, Hanin Zawabi, an incredible woman, incredible freedom fighter, uh, toured the U.S., I think basically the East Coast, the Northeast, and spoke to standing room audiences. She spoke, I know, in Clifton, New Jersey. And she spoke at NYU, and at NYU they had a last minute change the venue to a larger room to accommodate the hundreds of people who were there. And she is, if you've heard of her or seen her or heard of her, she is the number one target of the Zionists right now. She is, and I worry about her every day that, you know, she'll be able to continue on the fight. She does not back down. Uh, she sailed on the Mavi Marmara, the uh, Turkish boat that tried to break the blockade of Gaza, and she was on it, and she is threatened by the Zionists every day, and um, she is going to be speaking in Amsterdam on November 9th at a commemoration ceremony for the Kristallnacht. Uh, and she was invited by a Palestinian and Israeli organization to speak about racism. Uh, the crystal knot mark, mark really the opening, um, I think it means breaking windows when store windows are broken throughout Germany and Austria, businesses owned by Jewish people, and really um, began um, kind of, not the first step, but a major step in what unfolded afterwards. And um, Sister Hanin is going to be speaking in Amsterdam uh, to Mark Kristallnacht, so um, I think that's great. To commemorate it. To commemorate it. Yes. yes, yes, there is an annual commemoration of, of the event, even here in New York, and, and she is the guest speaker there. So, the Palestinian resistance, October 2015, um, amazing. Um, I watch the videos every day, I try to see, you know, what's going on, where it's going on, um, and it is a message from the streets 
from the post-Oslo generation of Palestinian youth. And um, if you watch the videos, um, getting beyond what we see on corporate media, it's much more, what's going on now in Palestine is much more than the so-called lone wolf confrontations. Um, there are huge confrontations in the streets, uh, in the West Bank, in many, many cities, uh, in Jerusalem, and in 48 Palestine, referring to that part of Palestine, um, some call Israel, the state of Israel, but the part of Palestine that was occupied in 1948. Uh, the young people in the streets, um, they don't have a strategic plan. Um, it's not organized. Um, it's based on reactions to the horror of the occupation. Um, the occupation is not, as some like to prescribe, a velvet glove. Um, it's a closed fist. And it's daily humiliation, humiliation of your friends, humiliation of your parents. And uh, finally, um, it's exploded into the street. Um, and it's much more than emotional or religious motivations that are propelling Palestinian youth. It's resistance to the occupation and resistance to the apartheid living conditions that the Palestinian people find themselves living in. Um, all the pessimistic analyses and meager expectations of Palestinian resistance we've heard in the last few years, we, cannot, we can now throw out the window because all we have to do is see how the youth of Palestine are, are resisting um, against, you know, they resist with rocks, with slingshots, with knives, and uh, the Israelis, of course, armed to the teeth, supplied by the U.S. and uh, other NATO countries. Um, the um, interesting um, quote I just want to, from a Palestinian uh, political analyst and comrade, Nasser Ibrahim, and he wrote in an article, the first messages proclaimed by Palestinian youth on the forefront of resistance is that the Palestinian people cannot be restricted, seized, or controlled because an awareness of fundamental rights is entrenched in Palestinian collective consciousness. In this sense, the collective will to assemble surpasses all other considerations. The profound and decisive message being said is that Israeli provocations touch the deep chord of national and personal dignity in Palestinians, and the response has been direct and inclusive to a large extent so far. And it's just reading that, if you took out the word Palestinian and put in black or African American and took out any words referring to Israel and put in the cops, it would just uh, equal black, the Black Lives Matter movement here uh, in a different degree, in a different way. Um, we're here in um, North America and um, there in Palestine, things are a little different, but it so mirrors um, what's going on here with what's going on there. Um, the youth of Palestine in the streets have really given a message to the leadership, particularly of the Palestine Authority. And that is, uh, we refuse to give in to the plans and policies of the occupation. Um, all the meetings and agreements in Oslo, they've, got, they've gone nowhere. Palestinian land keeps on being expropriated. Uh, Palestinian youth uh, are gunned down in the streets. The, the whole Palestinian people live in a situation of apartheid, and while some things have changed, most things have not changed. Um, the Palestinian youth have given a message to the world that the Palestinian issue is not a humanitarian issue. 
it is an issue of national libera liber liberation. And the Palestinian people, particularly the youth, are exercising their right to resistance. And whether that resistance is spontaneous, whether it's organized, whether it's pre-planned, pre we have to support uh, whatever they do. So, um, you know, let's continue to be inspired by the Palestinian people. Long live Palestine. Long live the Palestinian resistance. Down with Zionism and to be an anti-Zionist is to be an anti-racist. So, thank you, comrades. And really, we could expand that to the relationship of police forces throughout the United States and Israel. Um, Israel um, is a live laboratory for population control and uses leading edge technology in population control, whether it's um, controlling people through monitoring uh, their activities in cyberspace, monitoring their activities in the street, um, other, other ways of monitoring their activities, and there are um, constantly um, police uh, personnel, usually higher ranking police personnel, uh, traveling to Israel for, you know, week long seminars, four day seminars, you know how those things work. But um, I remember reading that the um, higher ranking police in the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department had themselves been on, you know, had taken these seminars. So um, while uh, the NYPD actually has an office in Tel Aviv and um, has a close kind of relationship there, um, way beyond that is, is um, the relationship of police forces throughout the U.S. Um, another thing I like to mention is um, looking at the uh, video last week in Times Square is um, the growth in the Palestine solidarity movement throughout the world but particularly in the US and I can remember um, a few decades ago going on a demonstration uh, in front of the Israeli mission to the UN uh, with three other comrades, one over here, Eddie <laughs> Myself, Eddie, and I don't remember who the other two comrades were, and uh, I think Comrade Hillel. And um, that was a demonstration, and the Israelis had launched an attack uh, into Lebanon, I think it was in 1978, and we had a demonstration, and that was it, four of us. And probably Bill Dorries. And we were attacked by a right-wing Zionist organization, the Jewish Defense League. But um, imagine now, from four to like 4,000, you know, so we should all um, congratulate ourselves. And um, la lastly, just summing up um, the results of the, um, the heroic um, resistance against occupation and apartheid that we see today. So what are the results? We don't see any Israeli planes shot down. We didn't see any Israeli tanks blown up. We didn't see, you know, other than street corners, any large areas of Palestine liberated. But, um, you know, war is always fought on different levels. Um, and one of the levels is psychological. And there definitely is a destabilization of uh, the settler state in Israel, the population there. And um, just the other day, in um, kind of a right-wing Israeli newspaper uh, called Arut Sheva, there was an article about um, Israel hotlines for psychological assistance have become overwhelmed in recent weeks as Israelis suffer under the constant fear of new terror attacks. And uh, they have a quote uh, from 
Gila Sella, who is the director of a hotline for support and psychological assistance, and she says, we're collapsing under the burden. We have an increase of more than 100% in calls. Every volunteer network we have is active, and we even had to form an emergency team. All of Israel seems to be turning to our hotlines. Um, and she mentions that a lot of the callers are suffering from PTSD, and many of them are soldiers, many of them are reservists who are calling because they're afraid they're going to be called up soon. So, you know, um, that is a, you know, we hate to see people who are in that state of mind. We have people here, some of our comrades here work in the field of psychology and they kind of know what that is. But at the same time, you know, this is a war of liberation and after Palestine is liberated, we can deal with uh, proper treatment of these issues, but right now we salute uh, the Palestinian people who have taken this to uh, a new level. So, okay. Um, there's a question. I, I really don't know the answer to this. A BDS movement with regards to sports teams particularly in the soccer and world? I, yeah, a number of teams have taken stands against uh, Israel in, you know, in, in soccer games, you know, in solidarity with, with Palestine, you know, um, not, not taking the stand for the same field you should. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so I guess that's it. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, comrade.